Okay, I think we can get started as we're closing in on 12.05. Um, welcome everyone to a, another Cardiology Grand Rounds. Uh, today, um, we are very fortunate to be joined by Ajay Kiptane, um, who is, uh, will be talking to us about renal denervation. So Dr. Kirtani, um, just for some introduction, is the director of the Columbia Interventional Cardiovascular Care Program and professor of medicine at um, the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Um, he is a graduate of Princeton University and attended medical school at Columbia. He completed his residency, chief residency in internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. So we're very uh, happy to have him back for this talk. Um, he then completed fellowships in cardiovascular disease and coronary and peripheral vascular intervention at Beth Israel and Harvard Medical School, additionally obtaining a master's of science in clinical epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. He is an internationally renowned leader in the field of interventional cardiology with a particular focus on providing exceptional care to patients with complex coronary and peripheral vascular disease. Uh, Dr. Kirtani's uh, expertise and contributions have earned him a distinguished reputation in the medical community. Um, in addition to his clinical commitments, uh, he has a strong interest in clinical education. And research, serving as the academic officer of the Division of Cardiology at Columbia, and um, he is the director of the Cardiovascular Research Foundation's uh, Transcatheter Cardiovascular Therapeutics. Um, Dr. Kirtani's research interests are in clinical trial methodology and outcomes of device based and pharmacologic interventions in interventional cardiology, um, of which we are very fortunate to hear um, from his expertise on renal denervation. So, um, Dr. Kirtani, if you want to take it away. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, for, no, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And it's um, really a privilege for me to be giving this grand rounds. I owe pretty much, you know, everything formative about my, um, you know, existence in medicine to, you know, what happened in medical school here at Columbia, but then my residency at UCSF. It was truly a wonderful experience. Um, I, I literally got married a week before, uh, came out to San Francisco, fell in love with the West Coast, learned about hiking and all these things that these East Coast folks think we do crazy because we're not going to the beach. We want to go hiking. I learned it all out there. Um, and then also my approach to medicine, which, you know, really encompassed all three hospitals and the amalgamation of all three together. So it's really been, a, it's a privilege for me. I, I was telling uh, James that when I land at SFO, I feel this sense of calm. And when I um, get back in the airport and there's a line of people waiting to board and they all have New York accents, even though I'm a, basically a New Yorker, um, I, I, the stress levels go up. So uh, maybe I need to be denervated. But anyway, uh, this is this is the talk a little bit about um, a journey. Um, and I think what you'll see from it is that I'm, I'm a clinically based um trialist. And so a lot of the way I use evidence-based medicine is, um, you know, how can I apply it to individual patients? What's the unmet need? And then what's the real evidence that we can help them and trying to apply therapies for the patients that actually need it and really trying to avoid it for those that don't. So that's the way I educate and hopefully that'll come through across uh, in this talk. Um, this next slide lists all of my disclosures, and um, I literally list everything um, on here. Uh, the germane ones to this talk are research grants uh, from Medtronic and Recor uh, for trials that we've conducted, but there's uh, no personal disclosures um, that I have specifically with, except for you know meals and travel. So just to start off with, it's cardiology grand rounds, and it should be pretty obvious to most of us that um, blood pressure really relates to outcomes or adverse outcomes, the higher the blood pressure is. Um, but it's really important to emphasize this and to emphasize how great the effect of blood pressure is in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. Yes, I'm an interventional cardiologist, but um, I like interventions that work. And so if you can get upstream and treat blood pressure, then you might obviate some of the later interventions that we have to do when patients present with end-stage forms of disease. And so this, this finding of elevated blood pressure and this significant relation to adverse outcomes is a fundamental one to this talk, as well as the mindset that you need to take when treating hypertension. 
And the reason I say it is because we, despite having multiple medications, despite having education about lifestyle and a variety of ways to do it at our disposal, do terribly when it comes to blood pressure control. So this is from JAMA 2021. If you look on the left, the rates of blood pressure control among uh, adults with hypertension, not only um, is it staying, uh, is it sort of languishing at around 50%, it's actually gone down in the last decade or so. And even among those that take antihypertensive medications, they just don't get to control. By the way, this is um, with older types of cut points for goals. And if you were to sort of uh, you know, use the sprint cut points, it would probably be even worse. So a good clinical case scenario that explains why this might be is this is a friend of friend of mine, Naomi Fisher, who I've been a co-investigator with in, in uh, several trials. And this may be germane even more because um, the Super Bowl is this weekend. So it's a different sport, obviously, but I'm a sports fan. And so we'll just take the journey of this patient. Um, this is a patient who initially showed up to Naomi, had her blood pressure 144 over 92. And the reason he said it was elevated was because it was the playoffs and the Sox beat the Yankees. And so there was Fenway traffic and his blood pressure was elevated. So he didn't really want to do anything about it. A couple of weeks later, blood pressure was elevated, but that's because he was so excited that there were, um, you know, world champions and there may have been some um, celebration um, that would also lead to imbibing substances that would raise blood pressure. So that's why the blood pressure was elevated. Patient came back um, the following year and had a elevated blood pressure once again, but this was attributed to be terrible arthritis pain. And this was not for efforts to try to convince the patient to potentially take medicines. It was just, this is the reason why. The following year came back, blood pressure was elevated. The elevator was broken and he took the stairs. That's why it was elevated. Two months later, it was a stressful week at work, no parking, then missed an appointment. And finally allowed the diagnosis of hypertension to be made. I agree, I have hypertension. I'm gonna start not eating salt. Three months later, I'm joining a gym, hydrochlorothiazide, got hyponatremic, calcium channel blocker, got a ankle swelling, clinic closed in a snowstorm. And it's like three years after the initial diagnosis of hypertension and the patient's blood pressure is still poorly controlled. Now, yes, this is a contrived sort of case. This actually is based upon a real patient when she reviewed because Naomi gets referred patients with resistant hypertension. But if you were to take each and every one of these individual episodes, it is not dissimilar to what people sometimes face in clinical practice. And unless you're really fixated on controlling the blood pressure, these things get less slide and patients remain poorly controlled. Now, it's not just the patient's fault. I think that physicians are also at fault because we often think, look, I'm going to write this prescription for medications. You're going to be fine. You're just going to control your blood pressure and things are going to be okay. But the patient receiving those directions and that perception may sort of feel like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to take pills for the rest of my life. You know, this is a problem. And this doesn't mean we need to denervate people to get over this problem. What it means is we have to be better educators and we have to, in a conversation with patients, negotiate with them and help them understand why they should take medications or adopt lifestyle modification for a medical condition that they typically don't feel. They don't perceive symptoms necessarily due to hypertension until you start having end organ damage. So there's a big dissociation here. It's interesting. There is data on this. If um, a physician writes a prescription, the likelihood that the patient fills that prescription is about two and three. And the likelihood that the patient takes the medication as prescribed is also about two and three, obviously worse if it's BID or TID. You multiply those two probabilities together, you're right about 50% adherent. Now, I like to think I'm a wonderful doctor. I trained at UCSF and I, I'm better than that. And that may be true, but maybe not. And we need to be self-reflective as physicians and do a much better job at educating patients and helping them understand why, because we might be able to control their blood pressure simply by doing a better job educationally. And there's some data that should support that. In the real world though, it's unfortunate that about half their patients have stopped their blood pressure medications within a year. This may be due to just not really experiencing symptoms. It may be due to lack of education in terms of what this means for their adverse outcomes later. And it also may be because of side effects. We just don't know. I don't know if any of you all are on blood pressure medications. Sadly, as I've gotten older, I have developed some hypertension. I have to, I had side effects. And so I had to play around with the medicines a little bit till I could get on a regimen that I could tolerate. Many patients don't get given that chance and that's a real educational gap. Um, and it's especially emphasized if there are disparities in care and specifically um, groups of patients that don't have as much a medical care and outreach to be able to affect those changes. If you look at data from SPRINT, everybody's familiar with the SPRINT trial showing that if you lowered blood pressure to 130s um, or below systolic, you could actually 
it reduced mortality and reduced cardiovascular outcomes. A very sobering analysis from Sprint that was presented is published in JAMA Cardiology last year or two years ago, and it showed that after the trial ended, trial results were, were available, so people knew what the results were. Basically, patients' blood pressures drifted back to where they were at the beginning of the trial. And this is among motivated sites participating in the trial, certainly happy with the trial results, and yet you found blood pressures drift back. So there's a need for full court press when it comes to lifestyle modification, medical therapy, and then potentially other therapies as well. Um, and this just sort of hammers home the slide that if you had a patient population, you took all of your clinic patients or everybody in your health system, and you dropped their blood pressure by just two millimeters of mercury on average across the entire population, you'd redu reduce stroke mortality by 10% and ischemic heart disease mortality by 7%. There are a few things that have that degree of public health impact. And as cardiologists, we often sort of focus on, you know, complex PCI and TAVR and, you know, EP studies and, and everything else, uh, you know, tissue Doppler imaging in the echo lab. If we focus better on hypertension, simple prevention, lifestyle modification, and getting patients on the right medication, we would dramatically impact all of these bad things that we then subsequently see. So it's a real important lesson uh, as a whole. So where does the sympathetic nervous system come in and where does this fit in with catheter-based innervation? Um, I just wanted to point out, most people know what the sympathetic nervous system is. This is actually, I think, of, as I said, I'm a sports fan, a pretty cool paper or research uh, letter from the New England Journal showing what happened during the World Cup. Um, when, when it comes to ACS admissions, whenever Germany played. So this was Bavarian admissions. And every time Germany played a game that counted, games one and two counted, game three didn't really count that much. There was still a spike, but not nearly as great. Obviously, these are the knockout rounds, even more spikes. Then they were eliminated. So there was a little bit of a spike, but not much. You see problems occurring. And so the sympathetic nervous system, you know, we, we treat it in heart failure. We treat it across entities. But it is really pretty important in hypertension. And if one looks at central sympathetic drive, irrespective of the type of hypertension that we see, with perhaps one exception, which I'll get to in a second, you see that sympathetics are activated. And so if we can downregulate sympathetic nervous system in some way, that could potentially lower blood pressure. Now, Remember, though, that not all hypertension is sympathetically mediated, and this comes, um, becomes relevant when we think about therapies that act this way and how effective they may or may not be. Um, as patients are younger, it tends to be more sympathetically driven. As we get older, the arteries are stiffer, it's more uh, volume responsive, et cetera, and it turns out that there is some activation, but perhaps not as much as when patients tend to be younger, and this is a crude way of looking at it. You could look at other markers like arterial stiffness and the like. So back before we had medications and back before I think we recognized the importance of lifestyle, um, blood pressure was a real problem. Um, most people are probably not so well aware that it was something that FDR, for instance, really struggled with. He had blood pressures that were well above 200s. Um, they obviously caused strokes and, and the like in him, but um, there was nothing to do to treat it. And people basically got put on bed rest because there was nothing to do. And so this surgeon back in the 1950s said, you know, maybe I should do surgical sympathectomy to see if I could lower blood pressure. And this was published in JAMA and other journals and actually showed that you could lower blood pressure by doing surgical sympathectomy. It was a very morbid procedure. You'd have to actually survive the procedure. Um, but if one did so, it not only reduced blood pressure, but it also reduced cardiovascular events. So this paradigm of reduction of sympathetic nervous system leading to improvement of blood pressure and improvement in cardiovascular outcomes was set back then. But obviously, when medications came around, you didn't need to do a morbid procedure like this. Um, we do recognize, though, that medications are not always efficacious. You saw those data I presented earlier showing what the rates of control are despite having multiple medications, many of which are generic. And so this idea sort of languished for a while, but then people tended to revisit it. And the, and the, the goal here was to target the renal nerves, which are co-located um, in the periadventitial space of the renal arteries. The reason that's a, an attractive target is because one can actually take a catheter, get into the renal arteries, and then denervate the nerves to reduce sympathetic signaling that way. 
there are actually other approaches being studied. There's transureteral um, denervation as well that's being studied actively in protocols. I'm not gonna speak about that. Mainly I'm gonna speak about um, uh, renal denervation from an endovascular approach. If you look at this slide on the right, what you can see here is that the vessel lumen is here, the nerves are in the periaventitial space. So if you can target that region, you could downregulate the nerves. So the first catheter was basically kind of an off-the-shelf RF radiofrequency um, catheter. RF acts by um, causing heat through friction of um, within the cells, and then that heat lends to uh, denervation or um, the denaturation of, of the nerves in that segment. And the idea was is to take a guiding catheter into the renal artery, advance the catheter, get it near the wall, and then in a wedge-shaped ablation pattern, you could uh, ablate the tissue and that would denervate in that way. And this was the initial catheter that um, was, uh, the company was called Ardian and it was ultimately bought by Medtronic for quite a large sum of money. This is the zone of RF treatment. Um, and what you see is if the ablation is done in this direction here, I hope you can see my pointer, then any nerve within that range is susceptible. The deeper nerves for this type of technology are not going to be affected. They may warm up a little bit, but they're not gonna actually be denervated. And if the catheter is in this direction, things in the opposite direction or orthogonal to that also won't be treated. So this is kind of like a random stochastic effect. If there happens to be a nerve there, you'll ablate it. There's not currently a way to measure nerve signaling. There's actually experimental ways of doing it, but that's not how these studies have been done. And that actually will be relevant when I talk about the, the data with regards to this therapy. So at the time this was thought about, um, this was back to this patient figure again. Um, the idea was, is maybe could we could do renal denervation as an alternative to lifelong polypharmacy, which I think, you know, medicines work, but one would agree empirically, especially when we think about um, all the medicines that our patients might have to take. If you could obviate the need to take medicines with a safe procedure, big ifs, then that might be helpful to patients. So the first question is, is renal denervation efficacious? And so at the time, um, there was actually an initial case a report published in the New England Journal in 2009, where there was a patient who was on seven antihypertensive medications and had a blood pressure that was still quite elevated, had actually um, measured uh, norepinephrine spillover, both at baseline, but then after denervation, you can see there were reductions in terms of sympathetic signaling and a reduction in blood pressure. So this was sort of the initial proof of concept New England Journal case study. What's also important though to recognize, and this is gonna be a learn, learned lesson that will be throughout the talk, is if one looks at the initial blood pressure and one looks at the one month blood pressure, it is not like this patient got controlled. They got closer to control, but they didn't get controlled. And that's important because the messaging, even with these devices that's approved today, is not that you're gonna not take your medicines and you're gonna get off all seven medicines and your blood pressure is gonna be fine. The effect is more modest than that. And so it's likely that if you're very poorly controlled, you might get under control, but you'll still need to take your medicines or you could potentially wean off maybe one, maybe two medicines, but that's not gonna lead to dramatic changes in terms of your blood pressure if that's what you do. So after that case study came a series of um, single arm studies and even a randomized trial, but without a sham procedure. And so this was the, were the reductions that were seen, 30 millimeters of mercury systolic, about 10 to 14 in diastolic. And when this happened, there was a massive frenzy in the, the startup world, because if we could reduce blood pressure by 33 millimeters of mercury, well, that promise of maybe getting off of medications and maybe curing blood pressure and therefore not having cardiovascular events could be realized. And so at the time that um, around this time, about a decade ago, about 10 years ago, there were literally, you know, 40 plus companies that were in this space working on devices that could denervate. What was interesting at the time, though, is that a lot of the basic science, where the nerves are located, where we should be ablating, et cetera was either proprietary or not really well known. This moved way too fast. And the good thing is that things that move way too fast, especially in medicine, often there's an opportunity for correction if you do the study right, and that's exactly what happened. So just to show you an example of this, about a, uh, uh, about a 10 years ago at the TCT meeting, and this is the largest meeting in interventional cardiology, certainly in the US, um, basically there was a full Sunday symposium on denervation. There were innovation sessions. The FDA had a town hall how to sessions, abstracts, breakfast, all this stuff poised for a field poised to explode. And what the FDA to their credit did is they did not approve this device on the basis of these early studies. And many people felt that that was perhaps unethical 
if you have a device that can reduce blood pressure by 33 points, then shouldn't that be available to patients? And what the FDA said is, we're not certain that it's actually 33 millimeters. We're not certain this actually works the way you're saying it should, it, the way it does. So we need to do a sham controlled study to prove it. And so that was the hard line that they stuck to and they made a sham controlled study be done. And it turns out that when the results were um, released on January 9th, 2014, lo and behold, the study was negative. There was no difference in blood pressure reduction with renal denervation with that initial device compared to a sham procedure. Blood pressure actually did drop in both groups, but it dropped only a little bit more in the denervation group than in the sham group. And basically the future of RDN became uncertain. Those 40 companies went down to like three. The entire enthusiasm for the field went away appropriately so because this was an important finding and had this device been approved at that time you would have seen unfettered use that would have not allowed the device to be iterated and for us to discern what the true treatment effect actually was so I, kudos to the fda honestly for holding the line on this and it, i think in some ways could be somewhat of a paradigm when you look at device-based studies and even pharmacologic studies as well so if you look at the results of this trial, um, this is what they showed. As I said before, blood pressure was reduced in both groups. The delta between the two groups, though, was not that great. It was you know, only about 2.4 millimeters of mercury. So the question is, is, does it mean it doesn't work at all, possibly? Or does it mean that there was a lesser effect than we thought, definitely? And the question is, is there a real effect? And what is that effect? And how can we discern it? Fundamentally, if we think that renal denervation can be efficacious, why did this trial fail? Because you could just be a nihilist and say, okay, it doesn't work. Or you could try to figure it out a little bit more and try to discern a treatment effect. So first, um, it's important to recognize, as I said, when we were initially doing these studies, we thought and we were told to ablate more near the ostium of the vessel. And the reason we were told that was because the ganglia are near the ostium of the vessel. If you hit the ganglia, you get more nerves. Well, that may be um, a reasonable thought or a hypothesis, but it's a little bit problematic because the ganglia are further away from the artery at the ostium. In fact, the nerves, as you go more distal, start becoming closer to the artery. And so you can ablate away, but if the depth of ablation is only going to be like three millimeters or four millimeters, which it is with this device, you're not going to reach the ostium. So that's important. And this data came out in 2014, published in JAX. So it came out after the trial had already been conducted because much of this was proprietary, but then once the data started coming out, um, then you could figure it out. So note to self, if you have a device or a therapy that works for reasons you don't understand, you know, go back to first principles, try to figure out the anatomy, figure out how it works, and then try to understand it. And then you will be, you can iterate more safely. The other thing that was noted is, as I mentioned before, the device only produces an ablation pattern in sort of a quadrant at the point where you're ablating. So if you're here, it'll ablate here, but leave all this alone. Similarly, that happens as you come back. And so we were told when you apply the device to try to come back and rotate it a little bit, but you really weren't getting full ablations um, with the device. There's actually some data from the early, that early trial that if you did a lot of ablations, that was associated with a greater reduction in blood pressure among those that were treated with the device. But then further data came out showing that you really need to ablate a certain number of arteries. This is actually an animal model, ablate a certain number of nerves in order to get a reduction in norepinephrine content. So what was basically happening is that there were not enough ablations done. They weren't circumferential enough. So this issue of hitting the nerves was a truly random one. And in some cases it might've hit, in other cases it didn't hit. So this was another way to potentially iterate the therapy. Now, beyond making the device more efficacious, you also have to account for other things that can change blood pressure during a clinical trial. So medication changes were ubiquitous. When they actually looked back at, uh, at this trial, and I was a, an enroller in the study as well, we found that basically 40% of patients had changes in medications during the trial. We know that medications lower blood pressure, especially if patients take them. And so if you have medicines that are variably changing during the trial, and you're uh, trying to assess the treatment effect of a randomized device versus sham, it's clearly gonna be confounded by these medication changes, especially if the effect is relatively small. If the effect is massive, frankly, it doesn't matter what happens to the medications, you're gonna see an effect. But if the effect is similar to that of medications and medications aren't held fixed, then it's gonna confound a treatment effect. 
The final thing to mention is that in um, that trial, in HTN3, I told you that blood pressure dropped in both treatment groups. Similarly, this is the coral trial of renal um, artery stenting versus medical therapy. And what one observes in both groups is that there's a drop in this initial phase from baseline to three months. So just by being enrolled in the trial, you see a drop in blood pressure. If that happens in both arms, it then becomes harder to discern a treatment effect. So what you really need to do is when you design the trial is to design it with a washout phase or a stabilization phase so you can account for this difference, you then randomize, and then you see what the differences are um, to determine true uh, treatment effect. So we learned all of this through these trials, and actually it was a um, combination of investigators both in Europe and the US in conjunction with the FDA and in conjunction with the two companies that were essentially left in the space to redesign these clinical trials to determine if there was a treatment effect. Um, so what did we do? We basically um, went away from office blood pressure readings only. We made a stable baseline and we actually looked at ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and or home blood pressure assessment to try to get a uh, less variable treatment effect um, ascertainment. We iterated the catheters. So we basically studied where the anatomy was and tried to target the ablations to the specific anatomy, training operators to make sure that they were ablating in, the, in a consistent way. And then in addition, conducted trials trying to fix the medical regimen in a static as way as possible. So did off medicine studies, taking patients off medicines altogether and then randomly assigning them to denervation versus sham or potentially standardizing medications to a single regimen so that you could then discern the treatment effect. Um, these are all changes. And by the way, this design of trials off medicines is exactly what they do with drugs. If you did a drug trial and you didn't stabilize the medical regimen, there might be many antihypertensives that don't get approved or show a treatment effect. So what happens in the pharma world is you stop patients' medications and then you study antihypertensive A versus placebo. And then you can determine if you're going to go ahead and proceed with that agent in further studies. So that, that's the exact same effect in pharma. So I'll show you the two catheters that recently got approved and what the data is that led to the approval. The first is the Simplicity Spiral catheter. This is a catheter that was based off the former device, but tried to, array, uh, uh, tried to arrange the electrodes or the ablation points in a helical pattern, tried to go more distal where the nerves were closer to the arteries and to use many more ablations. So not just four or five ablations approximately, this, this catheter employs um, certainly double digit number of ablations in some cases greater than 20. Um, and it's it, again, introduced through the renal artery. Um, Basically, they did a series of trials. The first was an off-med trial, so taking patients off their current antihypertensive medications, making sure that obviously they don't have any deleterious side effects of that, and then randomly assigning patients to denervation versus sham. And if one does that, and this is what they did and published in The Lancet, there was a clear reduction in blood pressure with renal denervation versus sham. But the clear reduction was most certainly not on the order of 33 millimeters of mercury. If you look at office blood pressure, it was a delta of six. Um, if you look at ambulatory blood pressure, which incorporates the overnight phase, it was actually a smaller reduction, about four, four or three, depending on how you looked at it. Um, this catheter was also studied in an on-med design. So patients were, put, were left on their medical regimen, but stabilized for a period. Also significant reductions shown in comparison to a sham. This is not in comparison to you know, just standard medical therapy. Patients came to the lab, they had denervation, or they had a fake procedure that was done, and then the outcomes were ascertained during the follow-up period. Now, in this on-med study, um, this, this trial program didn't really fix the medical regimen, so they still saw changes in medication adherence throughout the trial. And in fact, in the pivotal trial that was more recently reported at the AHA, what was actually shown is there were not that great differences in systolic ambulatory blood pressure uh, when you looked over the 24-hour cycle. For office, blood pressure was a reduction in five, but the reason for it is they actually noticed that there was a differential increased um, adherence to and taking of medications in the sham group compared to the innovation group. And this is, even if you blind patients, they're not blinded to their own blood pressures at home. So they may take more medications if they're in the sham group, unless the medical regimen is really, really fixed. And so this was a major issue of consternation. There was a lot of discussion about this at the FDA panel hearing as well. 
Now, the good news, though, in terms of safety is that these many patients have actually been studied, and this is a large registry done in Europe, showing that the rates of adverse events related to the procedure are exceptionally low. Um, this is in relatively real-world practice, not just in the setting of these randomized trials. And many of these events that occurred are what you'd expect for patients with untreated hypertension. These are largely res resistant hypertension patients. This is follow-up out to three years. As a clinician, I can tell you that we certainly need follow-up more uh, for a longer period of duration than this, but at least for this, this, this was what went into the FDA panel of deliberations and uh, uniformly with this device as well as the next device I'm gonna show you, the feeling was is that this procedure was safe and not going to be associated with adverse events like renal artery stenosis. Now, the second therapy that I'll show you that was also approved and actually was approved um, earlier is the trials that I was involved in. Um, and basically, this employs ultrasound, um, ultrasound to heat at a depth of one to six millimeters around the artery. This is a circumferential device, so it's not just a wedge-shaped um, ablation pattern. It actually ablates in a circle, which is why you only really need to treat the main arteries. And the wall of the artery is protected by a lumen that has cooling water. So you try, you try not to heat the lumen, you only try to heat the space around it. Each of the sonications lasts about seven seconds. So the idea here is if you have nerves in this pattern, this is based upon a, um, uh, an uh, anatomic study, you'll basically get ablations in that zone um, based upon the balloon sizing being adequate to what the artery size is. This is kind of what it looks like when you do an ablation and as it heats up, you'll see this is a thermal gel and in a circumferential pattern around the catheter, there's heating and that leads to denervation within those zones. Also injury to tissues in those zones. And so that's why safety is an important thing to follow throughout these studies. Um, I won't show you the procedural angiogram, but this is basically how both procedures are done. Sorry, I'll go through it quickly. There's a femoral angiogram done, the wire is advanced, the device is advanced, ablations are done you take a final picture and, and you're done. And the, both procedures are, can typically be done in an hour or less. Um, you do need to sedate the patients heavily because this, they can feel this as the denervation is occurring. And so I don't know if you were involved in the studies, but this did require a large amount of sedation. And to do it safely uh, and correctly with the sham procedure, both groups required that degree of sedation. So the, what we did within this study, though, is we really focused on stabilizing the medical regimen to truly get the effect of denervation versus sham so we could understand what that effect would be. So there were two cohorts of patients. There were those that could safely be taken off their blood pressure medicines. So they had to have blood pressures that were elevated. It couldn't be 180 or more because it's not safe to keep those patients off their medicines for an extended period of time. But if their blood pressures were elevated off medications and stably so, they underwent screening with a CT or an MR, and then they were randomly assigned to denervation versus a sham procedure. The second cohort of patients had more resistant hypertension. They couldn't be safely removed from their medications. So what we did is we put them all on a single combination pill, ARB, thiazide diuretic, and a calcium channel blocker. If their blood pressure remained elevated despite being on that regimen, they were then screened and then randomized. One of the things that I learned through just being in this space is that combination therapy, the pill that combines two agents together into one, which frankly, when I grew up as a resident, I felt it was a marketing gimmick. You know, you, you're, we have lisinopril, we have hydrochlorothiazide, they're both cheap and generic. Why are you giving me a drug that you're gonna charge the patient for um, that, that has both together? Turns out combination therapy works really well. It's actually recommended in the guidelines now uh, for stage two hypertension, in part because some people have variable response to medications, but also in part because of the adherence angle. And I will tell you in this study, it was remarkable how many patients came in, elevated blood pressure on amlodipine, chlorothaladone, and valsartan, three pills. We put them on the single pill that had all three drugs at the exact same dose, and they screened out for the trial because their blood pressure was controlled. Now it's not easy to get in formulary and in pharmacies, et cetera. This in the study, it was actually provided free, but it was remarkable. And so combination therapy works. If there's one thing you hear me say, don't just remember that denervation has some data for it. Remember that we got to do good a job with medications and lifestyle and combination therapy works. So anyway, they were then randomized to denervation versus sham and followed up for two months with a, uh, with a static medical regimen and daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure was the primary endpoint. We followed them for longer periods of time than that. 
And in these studies, the, the effects are remarkably consistent, whether you're in the off-med cohort or on that standard stabilized medicine cohort, blood pressure reduction is significantly greater with denervation versus sham. Once again, not 30 millimeters of mercury, not 20 millimeters of mercury, more like 10 in terms of office blood pressure as a whole. Um, and what we did also in the study, which um, was a little bit of a wrinkle in the study design, but I think was very, very useful, is we remained, we had uh, everybody remained blinded, remained blinded after the randomization. And after the primary endpoint was ascertained, we added medications back to both study groups. And the idea behind that was to get some test of durability. In other words, if one group is randomized to denervation, the other group is randomized to sham. If blood pressure remains elevated and you're adding medications back, if denervation is still efficacious, then you should be adding less medicines back to that group to achieve a similar blood pressure than the sham group. In other words, the sham group who had a sham procedure should have more medicines added back to achieve the same blood pressure that a group with denervation got. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw there was a greater medicine burden added back to the sham group compared to denervation. We've published all this data in, in JAMA, JAMA cardiology and circulation. These are the, um, the results of the ambulatory blood pressure curves. What one can appreciate is that there's a reduction in blood pressure with denervation. This is blue. Um, sham is shown right here in red. Um, and the reduction occurs not only in the daytime, but also in the nighttime. So it's throughout the 24 hour circadian cycle, maybe a little bit different than medications. And the effect is seen that two months between two to six months is the effect of denervation plus medications. In the sham group, there's no real effect of the sham procedure. The medications, a greater number of medications are added back to achieve even not even the same blood pressure as the denervation group. So that's the wrinkle we had in the study, which I think was super helpful in determining if there was some durability of effect. We looked at the patients that had resistant hypertension, showed basically the exact same reduction in blood pressure in the denervation arm. The sham group had a little bit more reduction, and that was probably because some of the medicines um, that were taken during that group. But the exact same thing was found between two and six months when we added medicines back the sham group had less medications added back than the denervation group. Specifically, they needed less of a fourth agent. And the fourth agent is a mineralocorticoid antagonist like spironolactone. Um, this is shown here in this slide. These are the home blood pressure curves throughout the time period. Denervation, you see a drop early. The drop is sustained over time, lower than the sham group um, pretty much at all time points. There's a narrowing of these blood pressures because more medicines are added back to the sham group, which is shown on the bottom here. There's more aldosterone antagonists used in the sham group compared to the denervation group. The pivotal study that, that led to approval of this device was called Radiance 2, really showed the same exact effects. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. What I will show you though, is that when you think about patients, they don't just respond yes or no. Every patient has an individual response to whether it's a procedure, a drug or anything. And these are the individual curves of every patient enrolled in the trial. And what one can appreciate is that on average, the patients in the denervation group, there are more patients that have a five millimeter mercury decrease in blood pressure or a 10 millimeters of mercury decrease in blood pressure compared to sham. But there are some patients that actually don't have any changes in blood pressure and some that may have an increase. Um, the increase is seen in both the sham group and the denervation group. We think this is variability of just blood pressure measurement and effect. But it's important to recognize that everybody's going to have a variable effect. It's also important to recognize that two out of three patients will have a response as defined by a five or 10 millimeter mercury drop in blood pressure. That means one out of three won't respond. And this is an irreversible procedure. So what that means is that we have to be good doctors and make sure that we've looked at secondary causes of hypertension. We've tried to treat patients effectively with lifestyle medications. And if we've given it a real good effort and they still are uncontrolled, then this might be a therapy to, to offer. But I don't personally see this as a first line therapy for hypertension when one out of three patients are not gonna respond and are yet gonna have to undergo a procedure. So that's an important take home as well. When we've pulled all the data from these trials, what we show is this is home and office blood pressure reductions, eight and 10 millimeters from baseline as a whole. The adjusted differences are approximately 6.5 to 6.8 as a whole. So pretty clear effect of the therapy compared to a sham procedure. As I said, multiple sham controlled studies showing exactly the same thing. The other part that is important when we take home to our individual patients is the effect on the individual patient depends on where they start. So if the patient starts with a blood pressure less than 145, 
there's a greater chance that they're going to achieve control with denervation compared to a sham. If they started off really high, the likelihood of control is going to be very low because they're so much further away from control and we know what the effect of the therapy is. The blood pressure reduction is actually greater on an absolute scale when you start off high, but when you start off low, it's less, but the rates of control when you start off really high are going to be less. So this is common clinical medicine 101. If you have somebody with a really, really high blood pressure, that's not the patient you say you're going to have, you're going to get controlled and you're going to stop your medicine. Those are the patients who we do it because we think we can lower their risk, but it's less likely to achieve control. And that's just fundamental common sense. If you look at the proportion of patients achieving either a reduction in blood pressure of five or 10 millimeters of mercury or control of blood pressure, the number needed to treat is about three. So you don't have to treat a lot of patients to get these effects, but it's a distribution. And remember also that one third of patients are not going to respond. These are the safety events in the overall pooled analysis with this device. You can see it looks very safe. Um, but that having been said, these are in randomized trials. And we know as a clinical proceduralist that we can always cause complications with any procedure we do. And that's why it's important to be vigilant. It's important to have good training. And it's also important to be circumspect in whom we offer this therapy to. So ultimately, in the last couple of minutes, what's the target population for these therapies? I think I've shown you, you know, a little bit of the history of where we came from. I've shown you the scope of the problem, that blood pressure control is not great. And I've hoped you, I've convinced you that there's sham controlled data for, uh, for two different devices that demonstrate efficacy um, of this procedure. So who should we potentially treat? Well, in the European Society of Hypertension Guidelines, um, what they recommend is that if you have significant hypertension, you start with dual combination therapy in most patients. So what I said about putting two meds together in, you know, is, is actually in these guidelines. Um, and if you remain uncontrolled despite ACE or ARB plus calcium channel plan, uh, blocker plus diuretic, that's resistant hypertension. You can consider a consultation. And in those patients, you would potentially add an MRA, other agent, or consider renal denervation. So that's what the Europeans say. This was actually published before some of the data I showed you was, uh, was published. And I think soon we're going to have a statement from the AHA here in the U.S. Um, looking at what the role of den renal denervation would be to treat patients with elevated blood pressure. These are the FDA device approvals for renal denervation. Um, the indication is pretty broad, actually. This is what the FDA said. Uh, renal denervation is indicated to reduce blood pressure as an adjunctive therapy in patients with hypertension in whom lifestyle modifications and antihypertensive medications do not adequately control blood pressure. I think that's a pretty reasonable statement. The only thing I would say as a clinician is because this is procedural, because it's irreversible, this lifestyle modification and antihypertensive medications has to be done competently and with a good effort. It can't just be, yeah, I tried some medicines in the past, let's get denervated. Um, we know though, if we look across the world, that there is a massive failure of current multi-drug regimens to successfully treat hypertension. And we also know that many patients, if you actually measure their adherence to medications, it's remarkable. Um, patients will say they're taking medicines. You put them um, through a urine assay of what they're actually taking. And in many patients, it's just not the same. Um, some of this is communication. I, I know that there are patients who are afraid to tell us what they are actually doing or not. As a physician, I've, I've called patients' pharmacies to ask for prescriptions. Um, you know, we, we go over med reconciliation and all of that, but it is remarkable that if we ask patients, and if you just think about yourself, how many of you um, got a prescription you probably didn't need for a bronchitis and have three pills left or two pills left in the antibiotic bottle? Why? Because you took the first few days, you started feeling better, and then you started forgetting about taking the other medicines. That's really important in hypertension where many patients don't have any symptoms. Now, in the real world setting in patients with resistant hypertension, this was a randomized trial of the different devices. And you can see reductions in blood pressure that are pretty, pretty good on an ambulatory scale of um, you know, eight to 10 or beyond uh, with both devices. So resistant hypertension is gonna be a good target for these patients. But it's not going to be everybody. And um, there's actually some data looking at arterial stiffness. And those that have the most arterial stiffness, which is likely volume sensitive hypertension, tend to have a greater rate of non responsiveness to this uh, procedure. So, you know, I get, uh, since this has been approved, I've gotten calls from, you know, 85 year olds with, with um, hypertension and they have 
peripheral vascular disease and you, you, you know they have calcified arteries and everything, I, I, I say, listen, I don't really think this is necessarily going to help you because the mechanism of your hypertension is likely different. And these studies will, will need to be conducted, isolated systolic hypertension and the like. Patient selection for renal denervation therapies currently, remember, this is an approved device right now. So who did we treat first? Well, the person I treated first was a patient um, who came from the Caribbean. He had prior strokes and multiple hospitalizations for hypertensive urgency and emergency. Um, he was on five plus medical meds. He still had um, yeah, he still had elevated blood pressures that were typically ranged in the 160s to 180s and beyond, um, and felt awful. And he actually screened out from one of our trials, and I had him on a list. And when these devices were approved, he ended up being the first commercially treated patient. Um, I'm going to show this uh, his face with permission, but basically he's the type of patient that could benefit. And we're talking about hypertension, truly refractory to medical therapy with adherence issues. You want to rule out secondary causes. So he had had a CT. He actually had uh, uh, even um, uh, uh, more uh, aggressive lab studies to look for primary hyperaldo and other conditions like that. Obviously, thyroid disease was ruled out. All of those things were ruled out. Didn't think it was mediated by arterial stiffness, and he had anatomy that was suitable for this procedure. And so he was the first patient who was treated. You know, he's giving the thumbs up there, but I can tell you, I follow with him. He has my cell phone um, and he literally says that he feels like a new person. He, his blood pressure is not 120. It's probably in the 130 to 140 range, but it was never below 160 until this procedure was done. Thankfully, he was one of the responders. He could have been a non-responder and I went through that with him in detail as well. Beyond denervation though, we need more innovative care for hypertension. And I wanna emphasize that my, the point of this is not to say simplistically that we're terrible at hypertension control, denervate everybody. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we need a full all out, all hands on deck approach to hypertension control here in the United States, but in the world to basically allow patients to prevent the cardiovascular events that can cause issues. So why not empower the patient? So Bluetooth type capabilities, I don't know if any of you have these at home, they work remarkably well, you can track them, patients can send them to you. I actually use them routinely in clinical practice to have patients send these things to me. Um, it's remarkable that if we look at how much clinical inertia there is, it's not just hypertension, by the way, this is just a paper on statin adherence. Patients with established ASCVD who are on a high intensity statin or any, any statin at all, it is so low, it's remarkable. And one of the reasons for this is that I don't think we do a good job at convincing patients why they need to be on these therapies. There's a very interesting study that was done in uh, the London tube where they took random patients on the street and they asked them how many years of life, for instance, would you need to add, would you, would you need to gain to make it worth your while to take a statin? And there are some people who may have already been on statins. They said, you don't really have to add many years. There was a whole distribution of patients. And there are some patients out here that said, you have to add more than 10 years to my life to make it worth my while. By the way, I think 10 was the upper limit of the normal on the survey. I have news for you. Those people are never going to take a statin, no matter what you say. They just said 10 years to get through the survey. But if you actually look at the actuarial risk that those patients had of having an, established, having an event and plotted that versus their adherence or what their stated utility would be, in more than a quarter of patients, the disutility that they expressed was greater than the benefit they would receive. So for every patient, you have to have these conversations. You have to have these negotiations. That's why I like combination therapy because I'm not adding an additional pill. I'm just combining two into one and they don't have to take another pill. They have to take a different one, but nothing new. In addition, studies like the barbershop study, what a seminal study show you that it doesn't have to be done by doctors, but you have to reach patients in the communities and the environment that they're in. The only way we become effective communicators is to actually do that. If we just sit there in our white coats and talk down to patients and say, take this, no one's gonna listen. And this study alone showed no denervation, no new medication, simply going into communities could actually significantly lower blood pressure to large degrees relative to the control group. So all of these things have to go hand in hand. And it goes without saying that when you talk about a procedure like denervation, there's going to be a, a disparity in the term, types of people who are offered this therapy. And we have to overcome that and really make this accessible to everybody in a way that but, is um, suitable to them if we've tried everything we can try otherwise. Finally, there are other ways to do this. And this is an article in JAMA Cardiology looking at empowering 
um, people that don't even have farm degrees. They're basically people that are college graduates that um, serve as patient navigators to get people on the right lipid lowering therapies and hypertension control therapies. And what they've shown is they actually get Bluetooth readings, they adjust the medicines, they do it in conjunction with the doctor and a pharmacist, and ultimately are able to get better levels of blood pressure control. To conclude, I'll just show you that if, if you want sort of this, this viewpoint on how this works, what the holes in the data are, et cetera, I would uh, refer you to this one. This is written by Catherine Chow, who is also a UCSF resident, um, and, and Michelle Azizi and me, um, what we know and don't know about renal denervation to lower blood pressure. And I think it talks about the limitations of the data as well as the limitations of who would use this. In. So to conclude, what I would start with is just number one, hypertension is a real public health problem. There are many sources of poor control or even resistance. At present, lifestyle modification and medical therapy is the mainstay of care. We got to really do better at, at this as a whole. But when we talk about renal denervation, it's clearly established efficacy and safety over sham and multiple carefully conducted trials with more and more data emerging, but not with blood pressure reductions of 30 millimeters of mercury. And as a result, this was able to uh, lead to device approval, which happened last year. And to me, adding it to our clinical toolbox to treat uncontrolled blood pressure is a welcome development. For that patient of mine that I showed you, really had every treatment option exhausted, didn't have anything else to offer him, treated him, and he's feeling much better with a better blood pressure. And so it's hard to argue with that. Thanks so much. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Perfect. 